so it's my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Russell Wills. Uh, Dr. Wills is a community and general paediatrician at Hawke's Bay District Health Board in Hastings, and he was appointed as Children's Commissioner of New Zealand on the 1st of July 2011. He trained in medicine in, in Otago, did his paediatric training in Hampshire and, and Australia, including community paediatric training and a Master of Public Health degree in Brisbane. Uh, Russell's been the, the National Paediatrician for Plunkett, uh, a senior lecturer at the Wellington School of Medicine and a community paediatrician at Wellington Hospital from 1999 to 2001. Uh, he's been a general and community paediatrician at Hawke's Bay Hospital in Hastings since August 2001 uh, and recently um, as head of department and clinical di director until taking up the current appointment as uh, children's commissioner. Uh, Russell's led a number of programs in family violence intervention and intersectoral community interventions for children and young people. Uh, he's held leadership roles in community paediatrics with the Paediatric Society of New Zealand and the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, and he's contributed to publications, national guidelines and projects on autism, family violence, child abuse and medical aspects of children in child youth and family care. And Russell wanted me to point out that his paper and uh, PowerPoint presentation will be available with the other keynote material and uh, presentations that we get uh, on the AIC website after the conference. Uh, today he's going to be talking about the topic, Hard-Earned Lessons, the History and Future of Child Protection in New Zealand. Please welcome Russell. Ina mana, ina reo, ina hoe fa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Tuatahi kona mihi uh, i te atua, uh, i te rangi ko i te tematanga o ne mea kātou mā te rangi ki runga mā te whenua ki raro. Tēnā ko e pa, e awhinae o mātou māhi i tēnei rā. I mō te haura o nga tamariki me nga rangatahi me nga whānau. Tuarua, uh, ki te mihi ki te whare nui e tūnei tēnā koe. Uh, nga mate, haere, haere, haere. Kei te mihi, ki te iwi o tēnei rohi nga te whātua ki o rākei tēnā koutou. E mihi mana ki nga rangatira o tēnei hui tēnā koutou, nga rangatira ki wāho i Aotearoa uh, o nga hau e whāhara mai, nau mai, piki mai. Nga rangatira ki rāro i Aotearoa tēnā koutou. Nga reira e ho tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Tēnā tātou katoa. Tā laufa lava, malala lei, bula vinaka, ki o rana, namaste, good morning. Um, thank you, Adam and Paul, for inviting me to give this, this final plenary. It's a bit daunting to follow Dame Sean Elias, Patrick and Nicola, Kate Morris, Lena de Moana, Des Runyon, Peter McClelland, uh, Tuila, Karanina, and the VCB chief executives so no pressure then. But can I also give my welcome uh, to all of you from both within New Zealand and from without. Preparing this talk um, has taken me on a journey. It's been, I think, the most difficult talk I've ever had to write. But ultimately, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Let's start. <coughs> Our history... Um, of how we care for children in Aotearoa is mixed. Uh, it's very mixed. There is much that we've got wrong, and, and we do need to take a little bit of time to talk about our past, because the past gives us a context for our present, and it gives us some guidelines for what to do and what not to do for the future. We need to talk about the present, where we are now, because I think that there's much that we get right now. We are smart, we have learned, and I think we have a solid foundation for what comes next. I love this quote. The future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. In about 45 minutes, allowing for time, I'd like to finish with a brief exercise. I'm going to ask you, if we have time, to talk to your neighbour about one thing you're going to do differently when you get home. Particularly, I want you to think about someone who you're not getting on with at home and what you're going to do differently to collaborate more closely with them. Please consider that thing while we talk. 
I'm sure you recall Leyland and Moana's inspiring keynote. Before colonization in Aotearoa, New Zealand, beginning in the early 1800s and accelerating after the Treaty of Waitangi was signed in 1840, Māori children lived in a complex structure of whānau, or family, hapū, or wider family, and iwi, or tribe. Children's care was communal. They belonged to the wider whānau rather than just their birth parents. Children were regarded as the embodiment of their tūpuna, or ancestors. They therefore had special status and were kept safe and looked after through traditional concepts such as tapu and makutu. If children's mana was transgressed, then the culprit was subject to utu, or retribution, from whānau. The practice of adopting children within whānau, or whāngai, was common and strengthened relationships within and between whānau. It was a great privilege to be whāngai. This is Mary. She's a young mother with her first baby. She and her infant would have been well cared for in this system. There's no concept of illegitimacy in Te Ao Māori. The unborn and born infant would have been tapu, and both would have been subject to the protection of whānau. The infant would have been cared for by the wider whānau if the mother wasn't able to. She may, the baby may have been whāngai'd, but this would have been a decision carefully arrived at by kaumātua and kuia, and as a means of strengthening whakapapa bonds, not because her mother couldn't have properly cared for her. Colonisation following the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840 brought Victorian systems of parenting and care for children which were very different. Children were considered chattels by the Victorians. Early employment was common, including in New Zealand. Parents were primarily responsible for their children and were judged harshly if they failed to meet their obligations. State intervention was justifiable only in circumstances such as poverty or extreme neglect. The eugenic view was common. Marsden MP Frank Mander famously said, consumptives and imbeciles and weaklings who cannot possibly rear healthy children should not be allowed to marry. I wish that was a view I didn't hear in 2015. Free maternity homes he held were not a good thing because they would lead to propagating a lot of criminal children who would be better out of the world altogether. So if you're wondering where those views come from, now you know. At the turn of the century, not surprisingly, things were not going well for children in New Zealand. Infant mortality remained stubbornly high at around 7%. The wonderfully named Interdepartmental Committee on Physical Deterioration reported in 1904 there was extensive ill health among the poor and particularly noted the high death rate among women in pregnancy and delivery. Government attitudes were changing. Initially concerned that, combined with falling fertility rates, the European population would fall, which would be inefficient, risking the country's ability to put soldiers in the field and men to work. Prime Minister Richard Seddon wrote in, 19, in a 1904 memorandum of infant life protection that babies are our best immigrants. The Army Medical Board in the First World War, in First World War went on to reject 31% of applicants for the army. So government's early responses reflected these beliefs. New acts of parliament were passed to ensure that neglected children were properly trained so as not to become criminals. Industrial schools were established and administered by the education department and by church groups. They also allowed for children to be boarded out and it's likely that conditions in many of these places were dreadful. A Royal Commission reported in 1890 that women and children in particular were being exploited with long hours and poor pay. Mary and her infant would have had a very different experience had they lived in this time. In the late 1800s, uh, Mary, if she, or if, if she'd been Mary, uh, and New Zealand Pākehā would have been admitted to an industrial school. There's a good chance her child would have been boarded out or raised in an institution 
And in fact, this was common. While some institutions were undoubtedly run by good and caring people, many were not. By 1916, there were 4,000 children in the care of the state in New Zealand foster homes. Institutions and homes license, were licensed under the Infant Life Protection Act. But governments and societies' concerns for well-being of children had evolved. The 1920 Health Act created a new health department, and the health department then had just two sections, public health and child welfare. Prime Minister Richard Seddon appointed as the new director of child welfare, Sir Frederick Truby King. Now, King had established the Royal New Zealand Public, Public the Royal New Zealand Plunkett Society and was now to be responsible for all matters governing child welfare in New Zealand. However, his personality was such that this did not work out and his responsibilities were transferred back to the education department. So this created a new role of child welfare officers and made it clear that government preferred children to be cared for in homes rather than institutions. It was also the first of what were to be many renamings and reorganisations for child welfare in New Zealand. The first half of the 20th century saw further evolution in how children were perceived by government, concern for ensuring the survival and well-being of children to ensure a fit armed forces and a workforce, evolved to a concern for children's welfare and education in preparation for adulthood. Psychology theory from people like Freud, who you can see on the left there, and John Balby on the right, had begun to demonstrate the impact of neglect in infancy on adult behaviour, which is a powerful driver of child welfare officers' decisions to separate children from their families and whānau, often for long periods. This revisits Kate's point earlier about, uh, the over, about overvaluing of science. This is the beginning of the modern understanding of the effects of childhood experience on later adult behaviour. Both Māori and European children were therefore often separated from their families for long periods and parents had little opportunity to challenge their decisions. Often, these were children who were offending or misbehaving or neglected or in poverty. Physical and sexual abuse were rare causes for bringing children into care in those days. Rescuing children from neglectful parents to save them from future criminality and mental illness became a prominent driver of practice then. For many in the mid-20th century, the intervention of a child welfare officer would likely have been bewildering. There's a good chance she would have she would have been a child in a whānau that had recently moved from her marae and her extended whānau into the city for work. Parents often worked long hours and speaking of Māori was forbidden at school at risk of severe punishment in Layla, as Layla and Moana told us earlier this week. Parents under strain sometimes developed what we would now recognise as mental health, as mental illness or addictions, although diagnosis and treatment for Māori were very rare. The child welfare probably would have been Pākehā, with little idea of te reo Māori, Mary's whakapapa links, or the networks that could have supported her, even if her own parents weren't able to. The likely outcome is that her baby would have been taken from her, possibly at birth, and fostered to a Pākehā family. Mary and her parents would have lost all contact and all rights to see or know the child. The child would have been brought up as Pākehā, with no knowledge of whakapapa, customs or language. Some of you will recall at least some of the period from 1972 to 1992, which saw fundamental changes in child protection legislation, policy, structure and practice. So the concept of child welfare gave way to the idea of a social welfare system with the vision of a coordinated service for vulnerable families. In 1972, so here, the Department of Education, Child Welfare Division and the Department of Social Security uh, were um, uh, recreated within the new 
uh, as the new uh, New Zealand Children and Young Persons Service within the Department of Social Welfare, so amalgamating child welfare with social security. But these two functions were very different, as you can see, in terms of their size and also their prestige. The 1974 Children and Young Persons Act was the other major change of this early period and the first review of child protection legislation since 1925. The new act separated care and protection from offending behaviour for the first time and section four of that act made the interests of the child or young person paramount for the first time. Research on fostering began in 1971 with the first large scale research here in 1981 by Mackay. This was the first research to demonstrate the frequency of placement breakdown um, and the research findings were shocking. Over the five year period of this research, remember this is 1981, children had an average of six and a half placements in that five year period with a range from one to 29 placements in a five year period. And you can see the range of frequency of placements at the bottom of that slide. So policy quickly changed to emphasise planning and permanency. From July 1981, all social workers in the Department of Social Welfare were required to prepare a plan for a child in care within three months of entry to care, reviewed every six months. There was increasing regulation recognition of specialist areas of practice with the creation of specialist social work teams in youth justice, fostering and adoption. More intensive work was done on entry to care to see if children could be returned. However, this meant that children who remained in care of course became more complex. Pressure from Māori mounted in the 1980s and in 1988, the Ministerial Advisory Committee on a Māori Perspective for the Department of Social Welfare released the report Pu'au Te Atatū, which was revolutionary and, I think, uh, wise and helpful. It noted the disconnect between the Western view of children as individuals versus the Māori communal view. The report called for sweeping reforms, including a review of practice and policy, a review of the 1974 Act, identification of children's heritage and links, financial support for whānau placement, maintaining children within their hapū, and greater consultation. So these tensions led to the 1989 Children, Young Persons and Their Families Act. So this is the act that Dame Sean Elias mentioned on Sunday. The act was revolutionary and world leading at the time. The tension between child rescue and kinship defenders that Nicola talked about was adroitly balanced in the principles in sections five, six, and 13 of the Act. So section five and 13 were in the original Act and include principles like participation of the child's whānau, hapū, iwi, and family group, and that relationships with these groups should be maintained as much as possible. The paramountcy principle, as it's now known, as Dame Shan talked about, was manifested in section six, but wasn't originally included in the act. And section six says that in all matters relating to the administration or application of this act, the welfare and interest of the child or young person shall be the first and paramount consideration. Dame Shan also noted that the new act included basic child rights. Remember this is before New Zealand ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1993 such as the right child's rights to their view being heard and given weight and decision making in time frames appropriate to the child. To make these principles real, the Family Group Conference was born. FGCs place families squarely in the driving seat. The FGC coordinator receives a referral, usually from a statutory social worker, but can receive referrals from other organisations in New Zealand. The FGC coordinator is responsible for contacting all those who have information to bring to bear on the case and all whānau members who can contribute to support this whānau. In the first phase of the FGC, all the information is aired um, and, uh, and concerns are shared. 
whānau attend this part of the conference and hear everything. In the second phase, the professionals leave and only whānau are present. Essentially, the whānau have to do two things, or not. They have to agree that there are care and protection concerns, and if they agree, come up with a plan that will address the issues. In the third phase, the whānau present and negotiate the plan with the wider group of professionals. If the plan's accepted, it's presented to the family court. If there's non-agreement, the child social worker must make alternative arrangements, which could include applying for orders for, from the family court in a defended hearing. The 1990s, which you can see have been expanded down here, were a decidedly mixed decade for child protection in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Neoliberalism arrived with the Public Finance Act in 1989, enacted in the same year as the Child, Young Persons and Their Families Act and the State Sector Act in 1988. Crown entities now had output agreements with ministers that specified the quantity of each output. So funding was no longer based on assessed need, but on, on outputs negotiated with the minister. There weren't sufficient funds to support whānau, to attend FGCs, or to implement plans, as many of you, I'm sure, will remember. There followed a series of rebrandings, restructurings and legislation changes that must have seemed like a blur to those who were involved. The budget of 1991 saw reductions in social welfare payments to parents of between 10 and 30 per cent and introduction of market rentals to state housing, which increased child poverty in New Zealand by three times over just a couple of years. In 1993, we had the Privacy Act, which overnight made sharing of information much more difficult. In 1994, the Weeks Review led to a major restructure. In 1995, the Children, Young Persons and Their Families Service was rebranded as the Children, Young Persons um, and Their Families Service, or SIPFS. In 1998, SIPFS and the Community Funding Agency were merged into the newly named Children, Young Persons and Their Families Agency, or SIPFA. 1999, SIPFA was renamed the Department of Child, Youth and Family Services, or SIFS. Is anybody having trouble keeping up? <coughs> I feel for you. Social workers were restructured into specialist teams, back again into generic teams, and back into specialist teams. Caregiver liaisons and social workers were appointed to work within education and health. I knew two of them, they were amazing, and then absorbed back into the operational positions. So Judge McBrown, in his report, that many of you will have seen, his review of Child, Youth and Family found a service then that was seriously under-resourced, demoralised, with variable skills, experience, supervision and support, serious difficulties with recruitment and retention, significant growth in numbers and complexity of notifications, decreasing availability of foster parents and other placement options, serious questions about some social work decision making and a massive negative media and public perception. Tellingly, he wrote, the current workload expectations on staff are reaching the stage of being dangerous. Brown quoted extensively on the impact of neoliberal economics on the department, which I think was incredibly brave his essential points still resonate today. The pressure on the department to shift costs of children in care to families and community services. That competitive tendering had led to fragmentation of services, reduced funding of preventive services, and a lower cost, lower skilled community social work workforce. That reforms had been implemented with a complete absence of longitudinal research to assess the impact on children unlike, for example, Des Runyon's study. Concerns with training, qualification, and supervision of social workers. And that following the Public Finance Act, public service managers were accountable firstly for their budgets and were in fact rewarded if they were underspent. Judge Brown commented, viewed cynically, this would appear to be the paramountcy of the dollar instead of the child. So the decade 2000-2010 began with two high-profile and tragic deaths of children whom child and youth and family have been involved with. 
So James Whakarudu in 1999, and Salil and Olympia Aplin, aged 12 and 11, in 2001. Both reports, which I've had to reread, make grim reading and tell remarkably similar stories. The cases also bore remarkable similarities to serious event reviews in other jurisdictions, such as Lord Lamming's inquiry into the death of Victoria Climbier. In all cases, the families were well-known statutory social services, health services, police and NGOs. James, for example, had had 40 contacts, 40 contacts with health professionals in his short life. In all families, there was extensive domestic violence, there'd been multiple short-term interventions by various services to address this, and yet clear evidence that the perpetrator had not made the necessary changes to his thinking or behaviour. Most importantly, in all cases, there were multiple failures to communicate and share information between agencies, and no agency had the whole picture. There were obvious skill gaps across all agencies, and on occasion, failure to follow established policy across multiple agencies. Professionals talk to adults, but not to children. The department's response in the last 15 years <coughs> to these reviews and deaths, I think, has been appropriate and helpful. In 2003, the department, MSD, State Services Commission, and Treasury carried out a first principles baseline review. Along with a significant increase in baseline funding, the review recommended that government clarify the expectations, outcomes, roles, and functions of CYF, address the demand for CYF services, improve SIF's interface with other agencies and sectors, and build business systems, information, and workforce capability. The Care and Protection Blueprint followed, and significant improvements were made. But despite the baseline review and implementation of the blueprint, like all jurisdictions around the world, notifications continued to rise. So this graph shows notifications from 2004 through 2011. So I'm talking about this period now between here, 2004, my battery's going to die, and 2007. In 2006, the department was merged into the Ministry of Social Development and renamed Child, Youth and Family, which it remains now. At the time of the merger, so this is 2006, um, CYF faced serious issues. Notifications had increased from 41,000 to 72,000 in just three years. For those of you who aren't working at CYF, just think about what would happen if referrals to your service increased by nearly double in three years. Those deemed as requiring further action had increased from 35,000 to 44,000. A hint of the impact this had on the effectiveness of the service is given by the number of review family group conferences, which increased over these three years by 40%. So CYF was in New strategy for 2007-2010 was called Leading for Outcomes. The priorities were very reasonable and included quality social work practice, addressing youth offending, and achieving permanency for children. And a number of policies were implemented over this time that I think have been generally very helpful. So they include High and Complex Needs, which is an interagency fund that coordinates and funds care for children with very complex needs that can't be met within existing services and strengthening families, which is a coordination mechanism for families with multiple agencies involved. A number of you work for those organisations and services, I know. A memorandum of understanding was signed in 2008 between Ministry of Health, Ministry of Social Development, and New Zealand Police, and that was updated in 2014, this time signed by all 20 uh, District Health Board Chief Executives. So good things happened, but then, there was the Mel Smith report into the serious abuse of a nine-year-old girl in 2011. And it had many similar themes to the reports of a decade prior with multiple agencies involved over nine years, poor collaboration and information sharing, and no one agency with the full picture. What was slightly different about this report uh, and more similar to Lord Lamming's report was the extraordinarily manipulative behaviour 
of the mother in this case. But Smith noted a lack of oversight of whānau caregivers, which contributed to the poor outcome for this child, and particularly criticised child, youth and family for failing to communicate with other agencies. So his recommendations will be familiar to many of you. Once again, he emphasised the importance of information sharing, collaboration and training of social workers. He also recommended placement of social workers in schools, similar to those in district health boards, a review of information sharing law and an evaluation of kinship care. So what would Medi's care have looked like in the 2000s? So imagine a 16-year-old woman in her first pregnancy with a long history of child, youth and family involvement herself, a violent partner, drinking to forget. As Kate said, I suspect in many places there would have been a series of investigations, but perhaps little actual help. Kate talked about too little for too long and then too much too late. Late uplifts at term in maternity hospitals were common at this time. So Peter Hughes, who you met yesterday as Secretary for Education, was Chief Executive of MSD at the time of the report. He and his minister, to their credit, I think, accepted the report and recommendations in their entirety. Social workers in schools were appointed in low decile schools. The law and information sharing was amended. Training of social workers was improved. And an evaluation of kinship care was undertaken. So where are we at today? Care and protection practice change wasn't restricted to child, youth and family over this time. So the violence intervention program that you heard about, those of you who came to our presentation on Sunday, was established in 2002 in the Hawke's Bay District Health Board and has since rolled out to all 20 DHBs. The program sets a single national standard for the health system in New Zealand for policies, intersectoral governance, training and quality improvement in both child and partner abuse. This is a key point in the health system. We consider child abuse and family violence as two sides of the same coin. The policies go together, the training goes together, the services go together. The VIP includes, a mul includes multidisciplinary care for pregnant women with multiple risk factors and a child protection alert system that raises flags when a child presents to another DHB following an earlier referral to child, youth and family. The program's independently audited and has achieved a consistent and high standard of policy and practice across New Zealand. Child, youth and family's current strategy is Ma Mato Matato, 2012 to 2015. The goals include quality social work practice, working together with Māori, voices of children and young people, Judge McClelland would be proud, connecting communities, and leadership. The Children's Action Plan you heard about today from the VCB Chief Executives, the Minister and Sue Mackwell, is government strategy to improve outcomes for the most vulnerable children. It is an impressive change agenda across multiple agencies and includes a ministerial working group, a vulnerable children's board of ministry chief executives, a national children's director with a secretariat to content from all the relevant ministries, legislation change, requiring all children's organisations to have child protection policies, recruit safely and train their staff in child protection, establishing multidisciplinary, multi-agency children's teams and systems for sharing of information. So this, I think, is a genuinely ecological approach, the kind of thing that, that, um, that Kate and Nicola uh, were talking about earlier this week. It's a huge and ambitious workload across multiple ministries, but it's too early to tell if it's going to deliver the outcomes ministers are hoping for. More about that soon. In 2014, therefore, it was a good time to review progress over the previous 15 years since the Brown Report and with the Office of the Chief Social Worker's workload and caseload review. The report is remarkably frank and honest. It took some courage from the then Minister and Chief Executive to release it unedited. If you haven't read the report, I commend it to you. It's easily accessible and it'll be relevant, I think, to anyone 
involved in care and protection in any jurisdiction. And I would be surprised if a similar analysis of care and protection and social work elsewhere produced recommendations much different. The review was extensive. Over 800 cases reviewed and over 800 staff interviewed. An independent advisory panel commented on the methodology, findings and the recommendations. The review noted a, that six-fold increase in reports of concern that I showed you before to CYF over the previous 15 years, a significant improvement program since 2006, and discussed the current and likely future impact of government policy changes. The review made 12 broad recommendations, and they included, as you can see up on the slide, better defining what child, youth and families' core work is and is not. Stronger expectation of proactive information sharing both ways. Information gathering, conversations and collaboration to inform social work decision making and collaborative casework. Improved systems to support staff and more time to work with Māori, Fano, Hapu and Iwi. There were clear recommendations to improve the standard of undergraduate and postgraduate social work training to equip staff to re for the reality and complexity of care and protection, close quotes. Supervisors, they noted, also needed preparation with an additional skill set. The review also found that caseloads were unreasonably and sometimes unsafely high. The first solution must be to not take cases that are better served by other organisations, share the workload and more consistently close cases that were not being worked on. But the report makes this point, that these measures alone will not reduce caseloads sufficiently. It is, in my view, inescapable that there will need to be an increase in statutory social workers. Finally, and I think very importantly, the culture of child, youth and family was examined. I agree with the Office of the Chief Social Worker that there are social workers and managers who go the extra mile every day for children and families. And that describes, I'm sure, all of you in here today. I also think the current strategic vision outlined by Mamato Matato is appropriate and I know it's widely supported. However, I also agree that there are significant cultural issues within CYF that make it difficult to achieve its vision. You get what you measure. The current suite of key performance indicators favours process and outputs over outcomes and quality. Measures that matter to social workers and children and families. CYF become very good at meeting its goals for timeliness and throughput, but we have to ask ourselves what difference do we make to children and families in whānau. We don't know. We do know that re-notifications and re-substantiations have increased. That is unlikely to be a good thing. But after that, data is hard to find. The review also recommended that investment needed to be made in collecting that data that measures things that matter and making that data readily available to frontline managers who then have the tools to manage their sites. So what would many's experience be now? Well, in some DHBs, Medi's midwife would identify her vulnerabilities early in her pregnancy and with her permission, return her, re refer her to her local multi-agency group. That group is generally led by a senior midwife and includes police, child, youth and family, a mental health and addictions clinician, maternity and NGO social work. Each would share their information on Medi and a complete picture would quickly emerge. That will be communicated generally, I think, quite well to Medi's midwife and a multi-agency plan would be worked out. Often, a relevant professional, like, say, an addictions or family violence professional, would accompany the midwife on her next home visit, be introduced to Medi and to get, together secure her engagement for that plan. Our experience is that young pregnant women want the best 
for their babies and readily engage when this is done well. We usually find the plan is adhered to and mother and baby are kept safe. If not, agencies can then refer to CYF well before delivery and the appropriate child protection assessment and intervention be put in place. So what does the future hold? The Children's Action Plan, I think, holds great potential to improve outcomes for children and families with violence, addictions, mental health, low IQ and poor supports. We all know these families are too hard for any single agency to work with on their own. As Des as Runyon showed us yesterday, it's, uncommon for, it's common for our families to have many, many adversities. We also know now that a series of brief interventions don't work. You need sustained intervention. It can be adapted according to changing needs based on a stable relationship with a trusted and skilled professional, as Kate described. However, these changes in policy and practice will only work if we commit to them. There are opportunities and risks that I believe that we, as the practitioners and leaders in this audience and at home, we will be the ones who primarily make this opportunity succeed or fail. I've listed, this is my idiosyncratic paediatrician view. This is not a government view by any means of what I think the opportunities and risks are. I really do believe that this is the opportunity of a lifetime. I can't believe how lucky I am to be in this role at this time, and I hope you will feel like that too. I really do think that information is getting easier to share, and John Edwards has been very clear with us. The Privacy Act principles should not be, are not an impediment to sharing information with each other where there are care and protection concerns. That's the point of collecting the information. I can share information with you, you can share information with me, ideally with consent, but if we can't get consent and the purpose of that is to keep children safe, he is very unlikely to take any action. I think we need to have standards in all our disciplines for undergraduate training, doctors, nurses, social workers, psychologists and teachers. It's up to each discipline to decide what that standard should be. But then it must be taught at undergraduate level. So for the academics in the audience, change is coming. Collaboration is the new black. It is a very clear expectation on all of us. But we need to know what that means. There will be local leadership. We will be improving services. I also think that there are very real risks to this. If we fail to address these, if we fail to grasp this opportunity, we don't get a second chance at this. I'm worried with the Vulnerable Kids Information Server, um, System presenting us with a 9-11 problem. So much information, so much data, but no real information. Kate said to me two very wise things. I think there's a very high risk that we will expose unmet need. It will become visible. And as I've said before to many audiences like this, there's a very high chance that we will overwhelm local services and local leaders. We need to expect that these things will happen and have a plan for them. They will happen. We mustn't hide it. We mustn't hide it. We need to make it visible and plan for them. And I worry about performance-related funding, meaning that services avoid the families in whom change is hard to achieve. We can practice safely if we do some things. We can make this work for us if we do some things. For each of us as individuals, there are things that we all must do. 
Child protection, I don't care what role you're in. Child protection is your job. It is a core skill set. Not all you butte, wonderful, specialist, super-duper thing. These skills are core now in 2015. So we have to have a thorough understanding of child protection and domestic violence, and we all need skills to do at least a basic assessment of mental health and addictions in our parents. We all need to know where our community resources are and how to access them. And we need to communicate well. So that means we need to record in our documentation what was said, what we found, and we need to form an opinion. What does this mean for the child? For those of you who are adult mental health and addiction services, this particularly applies to you. When we communicate, as Patrick said, we need to do that wherever possible, face to face. If we can't, then pick up the phone. Email last. And if you don't get supervision and you're doing hard stuff every day, for goodness sake, get supervision. This stuff should not be taken home. It needs to be left at work. <coughs> we need to know what collaborate means. So Patrick talked about leaving our baggage at the door. What does that mean? It means if you hear yourself saying, they won't work with us, they are hard to reach, turn, look in the mirror. Are you easy to reach? Do the services you work with regularly have your DDIs, your cell phone and your email? Do you circulate that on a sheet of A4 every six months or when staff move on? Do you? That's what collaborating looks like. We need to be sharing information. We need formal ways of doing that and we need to do it every time. So MOUs are good. I love MOUs. It's not about the paper. It's about the process of writing the thing and having a clear understanding of our roles. <coughs> and within our agency, as leaders, we must know that we have good policies that reflect practice as we understand it. We need to know that our staff have read them, have been trained, and we need to know that they are adhering to those policies, and that means you must audit. If you don't audit, you won't know. We must provide our staff with blame-free supervision and support. This next one's a biggie. How do we not let our staff become overloaded? That's hard. It's very hard. I'm not saying this is easy. And this last one, one of the things I really admire about Child, Youth and Family and the Police of recent times is, is both organisations' willingness to accept feedback from other services. I'd ask you, how good are you in your service at accepting feedback from them? <coughs> and of course, of course, really, really good services alone can only do so much. Of course, we need to address the causes of the causes as Kate said, of course we do. So that's why I wear a white ribbon. White ribbon is about men saying to men that men's violence towards women is not okay. We need to support it's not okay, acquire the skills of intervening. And of course, child poverty is a powerful driver of all this and we must advocate to address it. But they are not excuses, as Kate said. They help put it in a context, but they're not excuses. So what do you think would Medi's care would look like in 2025? Well, I hope that in not the not too distant future, we will be really good at assessing both the risks and her strengths, and the strengths of her whanau. I would hope that we would know those services we're referring to and handshake her over so she knows what's happening. We're sharing her information with her consent. 
to have a clear and shared understanding of what's going on, a clear, shared plan that we've negotiated and agreed with her and her whānau. We'll be talking often. And as we do this, the more we do this, trust and mutual respect and sharing of power and resources will occur. And I hope, as Leyland and Moana said, we'll get good at understanding both the paramountcy of the child and how we nurture whakapapa and mana. <coughs> so, to pull all this together, colonisation has been devastating for Māori in Aotearoa. We have a painful past as we've figured out how to find a balance between strengthening families and whānau and keeping children safe. We know what failure looks like and we know what success looked like. For this simple paediatrician, it comes down to three things. Collaboration, sharing information, having the, the right attitudes and knowledges, knowledge and skills to work with the families we do in 2015. More tato, a, more kauri and muriake nei for us and our children are after us. Norera, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā tātou tātou.